that includes me. There's my camera. Great. Okay. Well, welcome everybody to this afternoon's talk from the North Wales Wildlife Trust. And today um, I'm talking about wildlife gardening and especially planting for pollinators. As uh, Jay just pointed out, uh, the other previous talks are on our YouTube channel. So if you are inspired and you want to see what Wildlife Gardening One was about, uh, it's, you can find it there. Just go on YouTube, search North Wales Wildlife Trust, and then you find all the different talks. There's a variety on everything from marine to youth work and our reserves work as well. So yes, I'll just introduce myself. I am Anna Williams. I work as the Education and Community Officer and I'm based in Bangor and I cover Gwyneth, Conway and Anglesey. It's so quite a large area and I've got a colleague, Ewan Edwards, who does similar work to what I do over in the Northeast, should you want to contact him with a project or any help. So otherwise, the Trust, uh, we have 36 nature reserves around North Wales and obviously we're busy looking after them. We have a whole gang of volunteers helping us with that. So if you are interested to find out more about where our reserves are, or if you even want to volunteer with us, you can just find information on the website, which is there, northwestwildlifetrust.org.uk. And you can support us in other ways too. You can become a member. It's very reasonably priced and you get some very good magazines. And if you have children, you can be a family member and you get a, a watch magazine is called. And we are, I think the only organization who also has that produced in Welsh. So that's a great resource and I recommend especially schools to sign up for that. But obviously any families, my, my children all really enjoyed reading those magazines. So that's the Wildlife Trust. My work, I go out and help schools and community groups create wildlife gardens. And I also take children and well, arrange uh, events on our nature reserves for everybody but of course that has taken a little bit of a <clears throat> break at the moment our volunteering work is still carrying on however on the reserves so you can still do that uh, and I've actually started going to schools in the last two weeks I've got a new project going uh, giving schools grants and they both get money and then they get some of my time and also, actually, just for interest, as an aside, I'm working with churchyards on a project we have to improve them for wildlife, as many churchyards um, have potential to have very good meadows because their grasslands haven't been fertilised. So that's a little bit of background. And in this talk, photos are either by myself or a man called Mark Carlton, who I met at the UK Forum for Gardening with Wildlife. And they also have a website. There are a few good websites uh, to check things out on. So I will go over a little bit of what I did in my last wildlife garden talk, because of course, uh, both the introduction and then meadows, of course, is a lot, it's very good for pollinators. So that has to come again, and trees as well. So those of you who listened before, you just have to bear with me. Okay, so, Gardens are hugely important, forming green corridors in our urban and suburban areas, as well as in our rural areas, they're very important. And the size of all gardens in England and Wales is a staggering 3% of the total land area. And of course, if we all manage this land in a way that's good for wildlife, that has a big impact both on variety and species and of the species and individual numbers. So that, those figures, just to put them in context, is more land than the whole of the Snowdonia National Park, Breton Beacons and Pembrokeshire all put together. So yes, it's a lot of land and it's kind of sad to see a lot of front gardens being lost to car parking, as well as to um, gra uh, gravel decking. And I suppose people are thinking that gardens take too long 
But I think sometimes it's kind of a tradition that sadly is going. And I, I really, really hope we need to campaign to uh, dissuade people to deck over their front gardens. So uh, what is wildlife gardening? It's kind of obvious for I'm sure all of you. It's thinking about nature and actually stepping back a bit when you're gardening. Take a moment to think, oh, why am I doing this? Is that actually not the right time of year to do it? Maybe I can do it better. Maybe I don't need to be over tidy. Maybe I don't need to deadhead now. Let's leave the deadheads on the plants over winter because birds can eat them. So it's just taking a step back and thinking uh, about nature and you know, look at the garden from a bird's eyes or an insect's eyes, what is attractive to them. So of course, all gardens will attract some light wildlife, but some are definitely better than others. What can we do to attract wildlife? Well, some basic ingredients, they all need shelter. And that's a good place to start. Food, water, uh, and that's also important for our pollinators, bees. They need little areas where they can go and drink and bird baths is good for that in case I don't mention this later. So as gardeners, we can create a variety of habitats in our gardens, but in the past, maybe people thought, oh, I don't want a wildlife garden because it's all looking messy and too wild. But that's not the case at all. I was running a wildlife garden competition and some of the winners were very uh, well kept gardens, but it was more that they were, they knew what they were doing. So they were good for wildlife. A garden that's just abandoned to maybe bramble and other weeds is not necessarily that biodiverse. So I will go over the hedges again. I know I mentioned them before. But I think shelter is really important. And so a few native species here, which I would always include in a mixed native hedge. I was actually lucky enough to plant one yesterday at the school, 50 meter of hedging. And we had hazel, hawthorn, cherry, crabapple, and some holly actually we popped in that hedge. So these are all good plants for wildlife, uh, not just for pollinators. And of course, if you have the opportunity to let your hedges grow wild and flower and set seed for berries, then of course they have an even higher wildlife interest and value. Sometimes of course they need to be clipped like this in a school, but that's not a problem either because this hedge had plenty of um, birds nesting in it. So, Really do think about hedges as the beginning of your wildlife garden, or even if you've got a wildlife garden, you can add a hedge. And hedges don't just need to mark boundaries. They can, you can make them within your garden, if you've got a big garden, to just break it up and create different rooms. And then that's a, also a good perch for birds and a hiding place. And a little corridor for your mammals to move along such as hedgehogs. So, um, of course, if you've got stone walls like this, you can use the space to plant on top of them or use the crevices to pop in a few alpine plants. That's the first thing I did when I moved into our house because um, we were doing lots of building work, but at least I could do the walls. So have a go at that uh, and see what you get. Of course, the walls also, if they are dry, dry stone walls, they provide good nesting sites for our birds, such as robins, red stars, wrens. And then you might see shrews and voles at the bottom. Um, and all sorts of invertebrates will be hibernating in the walls as well. And actually, I came across a whole gang of ladybirds hibernating in one of our stone walls one day. So trees are very important for both pollen and nectar. Uh, as I often say to a school, if you haven't got much space, if you pop an apple tree in, you'll both get fruit for the pupils and hundreds and thousands of flowers for the bees. So here are some ideas of good trees. 
especially rowan with a lovely flower, birch, which are also very popular with birds. They come and eat the seeds, cherry, of course, and willow. You've probably seen them starting to um, flower at the moment. And they are definitely good early food for queen bumblebees. I'll just show you some examples here. The lovely blackthorn hedges. They have come out in some counties. I ventured further east and I could see a few of them coming out the other day. But uh, mine up on the hill are still holding tight. So I suppose in the next few weeks they will be flowering. So blackthorn. The flowers come out before the leaves, and they are the ones flowering now early on. Hawthorn, which is also called May Blossom, the leaves will come out first and then the flowers come out, and it is later on, like around May, that they are flowering. Although I know seasons have gone a bit haywire, so they could potentially flower quite a bit sooner. Elder is a great uh, tree to have, and Rowan I mentioned already. So not only good for pollinators, but for us as well. So for the foragers, make sure you include a few plants in your gardens that you can benefit from yourself. Like here, elderflower cordial and crabapple jelly. It's important, it's important to have the whole cycle of life and death in your garden. So don't be too tidy when clearing up old branches or trees that have fallen down. Even if you haven't got them, maybe you can beg and ask for some logs to add log piles. Um, and some queen bumblebees, they could go and have a look in log piles as a site to nest or to over to nest in or possibly over winter if there's enough shelter at the bottom. Of course, they're good for hedgehogs and small uh, mammals as well. So do add log piles for insects and invertebrates, as well as for mammals and the general cycle of life in your garden. Of course, you get fantastic fungi uh, as well, and all the various decaying bacteria that comes with it. So nectar borders. Uh, it's important to think of the site. So this border is under a tree, so it's slightly shaded but it does get a lot of morning sun. So you just have to think about that, obviously, when you are um, planning what to plant. So the south facing border is by far the easiest one. Well, truly speaking, a true north facing border can be harder, but there are definitely plants you can still use, which are good for pollinators. And we'll get onto some of them in a minute. So think of shelter as well. What's the soil like? Um, if you don't know at all, it's probably worth doing a pH test, or it could be worth looking at what's growing around your garden naturally. What are the, are they alkaline type plants? You know, chalk, uh, chalk lovers, or are they the more acidic loving plants like up in the uplands? How easy is it to water it? I mean, this maybe doesn't apply in a private garden, but certainly in communal gardens, you have to think about that. And then pack your borders full because there's no need to have empty soil. And as we just discussed at the beginning of this talk, it will just fill up with weeds. So what I find very often um, is that my beds, I just run out of space basically. Um, yeah, both of those photos are from my garden, but they have changed. The borders change over time as well. I think that's the beauty of a garden. They don't look the same from year to year. And they do evolve. And it's definitely a skill to keep the cottage borders going, looking natural. Some people, I think, wrongly think, oh, you just left it. And it's just, that's why it's looking wild. But it's not quite as simple as that, as you probably all know. So I'm going to give you some ideas of good plants. I have got all of this information on our website under the Take Action tab. Uh, there is Wildlife Gardening, and we I put down this uh, gardening or help the bees or garden for butterflies, and these species are listed there. So, Abrisha, 
they I will get photo later on with that little pinky purple flower that probably some of you already have in flower now. It's a great one for the early bumblebees and bees. Uh, honesty, we sell seeds all over the garden, but I'm quite happy with that because it's a great plant for butterflies as well. Food plant for the orange tip butterfly. And then Langwood, Palmonaria. So that has both red and blue flowers. So I suppose it's reflected in the name. Again, I think a must in a wildlife garden. Sweet Rocket will grow tall, Sweet Rocket or Dam Dame's Violet. And then other violets. I mean, as closest to the wilder violets you can get, the better. And they again are food plants for many of our uh, common butterflies. So the larvae will feed on their leaves. Comfrey can become invasive, so maybe choose where you put it. I have a bed only allowed. Well, it's uh, all all it's comfrey throughout the whole bed, uh, and that is a great place. I think that's a good way to have comfrey because if you have that near your veg garden, it's absolutely full of bees early on in the season, bumblebees and so on. Um, they'll find food and then they'll come and pollinate my vegetables and fruit in the garden. So give something back and you will get a lot in return. I uh, mentioned willow. In the summer, of course, buddleia, I know they can be invasive and we do spend time clearing them from our nature reserves, but there are a lot of different varieties of buddleia and there are some smaller varieties now which might be more suitable for garden. Uh, it's known and researched that the lighter color, the lighter shades of purple attract more pollinators than the darker ones. So even if you like the dark night and other dark ones, try and go for the slightly lighter ones. And that applies for most different flowers actually. Daisies with an open composite uh, flower. It's very good plants. Uh, most of them are rich both in pollen and nectar. Phoebe, lavender, so I'll talk more about some of these in a minute. Of course, depending on where you live, I mean, I find French lavender a bit of a waste of time where I live because they die in winter, whereas most of the others, the English lavender, the Hidcote and Munstead, they survive the winter and they can go on for a number of years as long as you keep pruning them back once a year. Marjoram, Oregano, Oreganum vulgare, is maybe the one best pollinating attracting plants in our wildlife garden here at our office in Banga. Uh, absolutely buzzing with bees and bumblebees normally on a hot summer's day. So I would always recommend that, especially as of course you can pick the leaves and use them in your cooking. So for any native plants that also look good in a border, meadow plants, field scabious and meadow cranesbill, they both look very attractive and we'll have more photos of them later. Thyme is another good plant for pollinators. So going through the year, you want to have some, try and have something in every season. And um, you probably all know the value of ivy. Uh, not just for the nectar and the pollen, but then later on for the berries, or well, actually now it holds on to the berries through the winter and they are very popular with birds. Cat mint, that's a great plant. Although if you have got cats, they might completely demolish, <laughs> demolish it by rolling all over it. It is interesting where they're attracted to that scent. Personally, I don't like the smell at all of cat mint, but they are a must in a wildlife friendly garden. Fairly easy to maintain, just cut it back once a year and they have fantastic blossom. The plume thistle or Circium uh, atrium, the sort of dark purple one. Oh no, I said it wrong. Anyway, it's the thistle family and Atropurpureum, that's what it's called. Isn't it? That one has tall flowers, purple, uh, sort of yeah, crimson and red maybe, and very popular in Chelsea Gardens, as is Verbena bonariensis, the tall Verbena, which are very delicate purple flowers, excellent for butterflies. 
As you can see in this picture, this is a sedum, spectacular. Uh, I think this one is the ice plant. And um, that photo was taken in school and we were, I was crawling forward to try and get it before they flew off with some children. Already half of the butterflies had gone by then, but that's absolutely uh, full of um, butterflies in the late autumn. So a good plant for your gardens, as well as the daisies. With the daisies, you have to take a little bit more care what variety you choose, because some of them are thugs and they will take over your border. So have a little research and ask when you're buying them. Uh, on my list, I recommend certain varieties on the website. So going through the seasons, uh, starting now, Oh yes, I mentioned the language and very delicate flowers, very popular with bees. Snowdrops and crocuses are also important pollinator plants at this time of year. While well, the snowdrops are more or less over now and the crocuses, but they have been very important. Of course, the um, Erica species, there's a number of different winter spring flowering ones. And they both look nice, uh, cheering up a dull January, and they are also good for wildlife. So yeah, have a go at including some of those in your garden. Primroses are coming out now. Uh, native primroses, I think, looks the nicest. And they are slightly more subtle yellow than the Gary colors, which have been uh, cultivated. So try and have some native primroses and they will uh, you can easily then spread them. Um, they would form little clumplets and you can just divide them and give it to your friends and they will soon uh, bulk up again. So uh, as far as bulbs go, the grape hyacinth on top left is a popular plant. Uh, looks, looks well, you might like it, you might not, but uh, the bees like it, us, they do, they do like the crocus. Bees uh, come in all different colors. Well, they come in white, pink, purple, uh, sort of crimsony, and they are native to New Zealand. And a lot of them survive our winter fine. Some of them are a little bit more delicate, but they are good for their blossom is definitely uh, welcome by our pollinators as well. I mentioned the Wabrisha. And then, of course, the apple trees. Always good for wildlife and pollinators. Going through the summer, um, you can see a few ideas there. I won't go through all the different names because it probably gets a bit boring. And Autumn, as I mentioned, Aster. And here, Going through the summer, and you get the fire fawn, climbers, wildflowers, yarrow, rosemary in your herb garden, and wisteria, another climber. When you buy roses, try and buy single roses, because again, the double flowered varieties, very often the nectar sacs have uh, gone because the petals, all the multiple petals are taking the space or where the nectar sacs used to be. So we'd always recommend you to go for single flower varieties of any species. Here's another sea of lovely flowers for your garden. I've mentioned a few. Ceanothus or Californian lilac can be a little bit sensitive to frost. Um, I certainly know we had a fantastic big one in a school in Carnarvon that died this winter. So yes, they don't always survive our winters. Uh, Eryngium, which is a lovely plant to have, um, even if you don't live in a sea area, they will be happy, sea holly. So winter, a few ideas, you might have hellebores, mahonia, which is a very good plant. 
and the witch has hazel and sweet box that are both smelling very nice. I mentioned shade. Here are a few ideas for shade. Uh, definitely there's a whole lot of hardy geranium which grow happily in shade. Box gloves, hemp nettles, dead nettles, ferns, not to forget the ferns, the langworts will grow there. Um, yeah, this, you can still have a fair few uh, plants growing there. Bleeding heart uh, and the Japanese anemones, they're quite happy in shade as well. So, you get the visitors that you are providing for. Uh, maybe you had hummingbird hawk moths, moths to your garden, amazing uh, moths, which are uh, now spending sometimes a whole year round in southern Britain as, it, as the climate's getting warmer. And as you can see, it's got a very long proboscis and they can beat their wings, I don't know, is it 70, 80 times per second, something ridiculous, uh, in order to keep themselves humming like that and standing stationary. The six spot burnet moth, those caterpillar feed on uh, birds with trefoil, one of our meadow plants. And here, this little chap looks like a bumblebee, but it isn't. It's a hoverfly. And I'll tell you later why I could tell that. So just some practical examples. What we can do, well, you could do, make this in your own garden at any size, a herb wheel. And we were planting through weed membrane, because obviously weeding is always an issue. And we covered the different segments with different color gravel. And just a few months later, it had already come up this far. Now, about 10 years later, I had to remove a very big rosemary bush, uh, which hadn't been pruned back enough, but well, that's life, so we just replaced that. And of course, with herbs, herbs, if I just have to recommend people who might only have window boxes, I would recommend herbs, because most herbs are good for pollinators. Sage, rosemary, we've got a bit of fever few here, and fennel at the back, and then chives. They look stunning, the pompons, and uh, they are popular with the bees as well. Here we've got a curry plant, uh, which I don't personally use much in cooking, but some people do a lot, and thyme as well. This is just showing another nectar border, a similar plants. And I like to include this because some people think anything like this needs to be squashed, but no, definitely not. So all these uh, caterpillars are feeding on nettles, so it's fine to leave a few nettles in a corner uh, as they provide food for this lovely butterfly. Yarva amrulio. So yeah, think of the whole circle of life as it comes to butterfly as well. Peacock again, they will feed on nettles. Many of our most stunning butterfly actually do feed on nettles and other, and fish, some on thistles as well. So peacock, small tortoiseshells, commas. Um, yeah, so do keep a little patch of nettles if you can. I mentioned meadows and I'm just gonna go through this a bit fast today. There are different ways to create meadows. Obviously, you can just leave it to grow long. We could plant plug plants. We can sow seeds, but it has to be sown on bare soil, either by removing the turf or by scarifying, which is really raking very hard so that you create earthy patches. But with all your meadows, you do need to cut and rem remove the hay at least once per year. And that's usually once the wildflowers have set seed. So say end of August, September. And here, option number one, just leaving. And if you have a lot of clover, that's a very popular plant with honeybees and the short-tongued bumblebees. So even if you don't, even if you have a lawn, 
and you identify patches with wildflowers, maybe go around them with your mower to provide simple food for the pollinators while you are not really having to do any effort at all. Here we were going for plug plants on a piece of grassland which had no floristic interest. And you can buy these plug plants in trays like this. I was actually out in Trisvernal well yesterday planting about 150 of them. And now is a good time to plant them. And we basically take away a little bit of turf in patches all around, planting them and then hoping that they will survive. And then this might be the result. Here's a lot of black knapweed with a six spot burnet moth on it and excellent for pollinators, the whole of this meadow. So in a place, a public place where there was nothing, no interest to wildlife, suddenly you have a meadow great for pollinators and then later on in the year I, on this particular piece of land I saw goldfinches having a feast of the seeds of these black knapweed. So normally you know what's good for pollinators will then later be good for birds and obviously if you have a lot of insects in your gardens you will attract insect eating birds as well. So in our own back garden we made a little meadow on this spot. We do manage a lot larger sizes of meadow, but I thought, let's see what we can do in the town. Small patch. And this was the result. So even if you have a small patch, you don't want to do borders and fiddly gardening. You might just prefer to put down some wildflower seeds and make sure you get native wildflower seeds and if you want them perennial again make sure that's what you're buying because there's a whole host of different types of wildflower seeds on the market and I'd be quite fussy at least to buy them uh, UK wildflower seeds don't bring something in from abroad uh, if that is what you're after so I'm going to go through just some ideas for good meadow plants the first one yellow one birds with trefoil a legume uh, and it's not just good for nectar and pollen but it's also a food plant as I mentioned for many butterflies. Second one here is a field scabious, black knapweed, ladies bed straw, you can have a little uh, guess yourselves now if uh, I do this usually with an audience, audience participation. So we've got some red clover, a bit of meadow buttercup, meadow crane's bill, beautiful blue flower, oxide AC, cell feel, which most lawns have and it's considered a weed, don't really know why, yarrow, and then last but not least, the yellow rattle, which is a great plant in any meadow as it parasitizes on grasses, so it weakens the grasses, giving more uh, place and space for wildflowers. We've got a different type of meadow here and you probably heard about annual meadows and some people associate meadows all together with poppies and cornflower and daisies. Well, they aren't strictly speaking a wildflower meadow as such. They, well correctly, as far as plant life is concerned, they should be called annual cornfield mixes. And these can be sown now or in autumn, but you do have to reseed them every year because remember they are annual. So you need to take the plants out and shake the seeds off for a second year. They are still very good for pollinators and in our gardens, of course, we can do what we want. And I wouldn't recommend it in the wider countryside unless you also are adding some perennial seeds in it. So a lot of cornfield plants have become a lot rarer in the wild in Britain because of pesticides used in arable farming basically. And they were a weed growing along arable fields and certainly even when I was a kid in Sweden we used to go and pick bucketfuls of cornflower for midsummer and now that would be impossible to do that. That's a red-tailed bumblebee on a cornflower. So um, I might just 
was wondering, just for two minutes, we'll just take a little break, just a breather. You can all get a cup of tea or a drink and then I'll carry on. I just gives you a little break for from my voice. Some nice music, now, shouldn't I? I'm not that organised. <laughs> also, I just I've come into the office to do this because where I live at home, the internet wouldn't be fast enough. So maybe you've had time uh, to have a little break, and we go on to sort of second half of the talk in a way. Um, just looking at a little bit more about pollination. So obviously it's a system to transfer genetic material between the plants, the pollen, and this leads to fertilization and seed production. And it goes on all the time and we maybe don't spare much thought to it. Um, though if we don't have pollinators, we certainly will know about it. So for hundreds of millions of years, uh, plants, have been pollinated by a wind or water. And many plants still are. Firs, spruces, willow, alder wheat, maize, rice, and many grasses. And most of the plants, as you probably associate with hay fever, they are wind pollinated. So obviously the pollen count is when these pollen are flying around trying to find a mate, another flower to land on. I'll just show some examples. So here is willow. And the will pollinated plants. So they look slightly different. They're constructed slightly different. They have very long filaments and the pollen is easily released from the anthers. Here are the anthers and that's the filament that's holding the anthers onto the plant. So a lot of pollen and slightly less of the nectar. If you want to look at this diagram later, of course, it will be in the recording, so you can have a second look. Um, so flowers uh, and insects evolved together, and the first flowers evolved about 130 million years ago. Magnolias and water lilies, you might have heard about this, and some of David Attenborough's talks and they were pollinated by beetles. The beetles, as an aside, is this year's insect chosen as the Wildlife Trust's Wild About Garden campaign focus, and that is launched this week, and there will be more information about that throughout the year. So the Wild About Garden is an association between the RHS, the Royal Horticulture Society, and the Wildlife Trusts, and that, I don't know how many years it's been running, it was, um, I don't know, 10, 15 years. And it's great that most uh, mainstream gardeners and gardening programs are getting more interested and involved with wildlife gardening uh, as, a, you know, as a theme and as a basis really to uh, do your gardening, thinking of wildlife. So beetles and wasps. Uh, the wasps, uh, the bees evolved from the wasps, and the wasps was the difference. I was explaining this as the school children the other day. 
The wasps feed the larvae on live food and the bee that feeds the larvae on pollen. So in a way, the bees evolved and they became 100% vegetarian, I suppose I could say. So um, the flowers, they are nothing more than a structure of pretty advertisement to attract the pollinators. And plants then evolved nectar, which is a fuel for your insects, it's a sugar drink basically. And so there we have it. It's mutual benefit for both of them. The flowers need the bees, the bees need the energy in the food. And there are many different types though, of insects that can pollinate plants, not just bees. Wasps, flies, hoverflies, not hoverfly, uh, flies, beetles, butterflies, and moths, which is not a photo and the bees and solitary bees. So I'll just go through the different groups to have a look at how they use the pollen or how they and the nectar. So in Britain, we have over 250 species of different bees, which is a surprise to many people. There's only one species of honeybee really, which gets most of the publicity and that's most of the worry when we have a collapse of beehives, which is a bit of worry, of course. But in the wild, there's over 220 species of solitary bees. And they do a lot of the pollination as well, and maybe go a bit more unnoticed. We've got about 25 species of bumblebees. And there are a few that have got extinct in the last 10 years. So we do need to make sure that we are not knackering a habitat too much to lose more of them. So the nectar provides the energy for the flies, as I mentioned, and the pollen is the source of protein, so the carbohydrates and the protein. And as you probably all know, the honeybees are social. They live in hives and big colonies with the one queen. And the solitary bees, as the name implies, live all alone. No queens, no hives. And the bumblebee have a fascinating uh, lifestyle. They have the queen, the, it's only the queen that lasts through the winter. And then the next year, new queens will take over. Um, and probably I can go into more on bumblebee life cycle later, but I might get a bit long. So the um, the bees, they collect the pollen on the bodies, store it in the legs or in the abdomen. Here on this bee, the solitary bee, Megachile, it's got pollen brush underneath. The female has this easily recognized by an orange pollen brush under the abdomen. And then they have baskets where you see uh, the yellow pollen collected so they can bring it home to the nest. So it's all the worker bees, they're female, and they are the important ones collecting the food to feed first the queen and then the uh, other bees in the hive. So you might have heard about bus pollination, and this is a very special behavior that uh, bumblebees can do. Um, don't really know why, but other insects uh, like bees, they can't do it. And so some plants have evolved a strategy of having special anthers, which have the, um, the pollen packed so tightly inside them that it needs this particular bumblebee to come across and uh, buzz his wings in a way that other bees can't do. And they can do it because they contract their flight muscles, which produce very strong vibrations that they direct onto the anther using the legs and the mouth parts. And it results in the whole bee being covered in an explosion of nutritious pollen uh, from that tip of those anthers. The bee will then comb most of this pollen from her fur and into her pollen baskets on her hind legs, but a few uh, lucky grains will be missed and they will go on to fertilize one of the next flowers she visits. So for some, the blueberries, for example, tomatoes, aubergines, the kiwis are some examples 
of plant species that require this form of pollination. And scientists don't know yet why other bees uh, can't do that. So bumblebees can increase crop production through more efficient pollination. And um, so as I mentioned, but also the plants I mentioned, but also cucumbers, peppers, seed crops, strawberries, cambrys, melons and squash rely on these buzz pollination. So have a look when you next see a bumblebee in your greenhouse on a tomato. So um, the bees collect the nectar through the proboscis. And here's just to show what we can do. Of course, we can provide the solitary bees with homes, and you probably heard a lot about it. There, here is a leaf cutter bee, and the female leaf cutter bee will cut an oval out of a leaf. They particularly like rose bushes and other plants as well. And then she will fly back to a hole. Here is one. She drags in the leaf into the hole. And then she lays eggs. She will collect some pollen that she lays with the eggs. She makes a wall and she lays more eggs, pollen, wall, eggs, pollen, wall. And then she rolls it up like a cigar shaped parcel. Uh, and they will sit there over winter. Next year, out will come uh, an adult bee and the larvae will have had food from the pollen that she uh, supplied with the egg. So it's a very, very clever uh, way of bringing up your children, <laughs> remote parenting. Um, so that's the leaf cutter bees. And we have other bees. Oh, actually, I, I didn't mean to mention. In the previous picture, you can see here, that's in a national park, they've also put some mud and straw for different type of mining bees, because some bees like to collect the mud and the straw for their nests, the nest building. And all these holes here, some of them are, you can't, the dark ones are empty, and the ones that are sort of filled up have got a bee, a solitary bee inside it. Here you can see, this is a thing you can buy already, which has got glass tubes inside it. And here you can see the different compartments I talked about with the pollen eggs and the wall. Um, very clever. Just to give you a few ideas, maybe rather than using, well, try and avoid using as much plastic as possible. And also you can buy, you can make your own homes with bamboo sticks, but you can also buy special uh, cardboard tubes from a website called Red Mason Bee. He's, very, he's got a very good um, website with these, uh, with these tubes made out of cardboard. So just some ideas for you. And it's important to make it waterproof, because of course, you don't want a soggy pile in here. And also, you want it south facing, it needs as much sun as possible. Here they've been put up, so they're south facing, protected from predation, and inside you can see the grubs with a bit of pollen and the walls in between each grub. These particular homes are made uh, by George Pilkington, who's got a company called Nurture Nature. Um, they're very clever. So some solitary bees, they nest in the ground, the tawny mining bees. You might have come across them in your lawn. Here they are, and you often see a little volcano with a bee popping out. If you have solitary bees, uh, something called bee was, they'd like to get your, have your records. But also your local record center um, would probably like to hear about them. And we have one called Kovnod in North Wales cough nod and go and have a look at their website and you can add any of your wildlife garden species uh, to this recording website and then it's also nice for yourself because you can get some kind of idea of what you've seen in your garden over the years hoverflies slightly different proboscis tubular fleshy 
And how we recognize them is the, as flies, they have short antenna. The bees have much longer antennae. And they also have huge eyes that cover the whole of the front of the head. So if you see it, and most of them will mimic bees or bumblebees, have a second look and say, ah, oh, maybe it's not a bee or a bumblebee or a wasp. It's actually a hoverfly. Yes, as I mentioned, they mimic bees and wasps. They particularly like compound flowers, open flowers. Butterflies and moths, they have a long, thin proboscis. They prefer small tubular flowers, which are often bunched in inflorescence like here. And like Obrisha, which I mentioned before. It's important to remember that the adult butterfly will need different food from the caterpillars. Again, I've got that information on our website, and here you can see the cinnabar moth caterpillar eating ragwort. And I mentioned the peacocks on the nettles. Beetles, they also eat pollen and nectar. You might have seen this cool guy, the thick legged flower beetle with the big muscles on the legs, or the soldier beetle, which are very common. Uh, very often you see them on umbellifers. Ladybirds, you might not realize how many people don't realize that, that they are also pollinators. They eat both nectar and pollen for the nutrients they need to mature and to lay their eggs. And they also, they obviously also, they eat insect pests. They eat aphids, so they're great to have in your garden. So, Sadly, some sad statistics, our pollinators are declining. And I think one of the biggest reasons is this one, fragmentation and loss of habitats. And that include losing 97% of wildfire meadows since 1960, which is staggering. And that is because of change in agricultural practice. Pen pesticides, of course, kill all insects. It doesn't uh, differentiate between the baddies or the goodies, however you look at it. Climate change has made it slightly different, but I don't think we can blame the loss on that entirely. And then emphasizing that bees pollinate 75% of our main food crops in the UK. I really, uh, with the loss of these pollinating insects, we could go from this to this. Uh, and so why, why do they matter? Because they are at the base of this food chain. Here are your insects and birds and bats and other animals then rely on them to create a living landscape and a healthy environment. So we could of course get into a vicious circle. We get fewer pollinators, which leads to less floral diversity. So how, what can we do? I think agri-environment schemes on a big scale are hugely important. And also thinking differently when it comes to farming. Horticulture is uh, not blameless either. Uh, we can definitely improve the way we look upon gardening, as I mentioned before. And some problem with horticulture has been these highly hybridized flowers I've talked about. They give no access to pollen and nectar. Also insecticides in gardens. Uh, there's a wide variety to choose from and I definitely would choose none. The reliance on the bedding plants, annual bedding plants. And although we can have exotic garden flowers, we don't have to just to rely on them. And I think also traditionally, uh, in all of the judging awards, Britain and Bloom, etc., uh, the thought of uh, provision of pollinators hasn't really been a serious criterion. And so it hasn't scored any higher. And it's probably about time that that changed. Go from your traditional bedding, maybe to something more different and perennial, which in the long term will cost less for councils. 
uh, and will definitely benefit pollinators more. So ditch the pesticides, think of alternatives, whatever you do, and maybe just try and, you know, if you have a problem with some things and the only thing you can grow that plant with is by using pesticide, think, well, maybe I shouldn't even try to grow that particular plant. I haven't touched on compost, but I do just quickly want to throw these pictures in because they are all part of a living, healthy wildlife garden. And uh, if you have compost that are left around or uh, leaf piles and uh, stick piles, again, they can be good um, <clears throat> places for the bumblebee queens to hang out in winter, hibernate. So for the composting, I would recommend two bins, three bins, even better, depending on how much you've got. One bit is active and one is decomposing. You can make lovely ones like this, or you can make them cheaply with pallets, or of course use a standard plastic one. And if you wonder, there's some grass snakes, which do like a warm compost. That's in Krikiev in North Wales. So, just sort of almost on my summary page, I thought I'll add this on bats because, of course, if we have a garden that's good for bats, it's also good for pollinators. The bats like our insects. So just sort of broadening the scheme a bit. Think of nice scented plants. I've talked about hedges. Leave part of the lawn unmown. We mentioned on that. Pond. Uh, I talked a lot about ponds in my previous talk and reduce your lighting and keep cats indoors. All good advice to get more bats in your gardens. So in summary, we have a wide range of flowering plants from trees down to the smallest thyme ground covering plants. Aim to have something in flower all year round. Allow your so-called weeds to grow in your lawn and then have both areas of long grass and short, have climbing plants. Make a solitary bee homes, but also leave areas for bare earth, soil or sandy banks, if you've got that, for the solitary bees. Provide the water. Make your compost and don't use pesticides for sure. So if I can get that message over, and I hope you can tell others to ditch the pesticides, they're not healthy for us either, so I don't think we should use them in our own gardens. There we are. Thank you very much for listening. And now I shall stop sharing. And I think actually I popped my email on again, if you missed it in the beginning. So for those of you who want to jot it down, you can do that. And that's the web address. So I'll stop sharing now, and then we can have some conversation. Thank you very much. Cool. <laughs> um, we've had a couple of questions in chat for you. Um